I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. What's up, Camp Con? Will you stand and sing with us? Oh, Lord, our Lord, how wonderful your name. In all the earth, your glory on display. The works of your hands, they show us who you are. 
under your feet, Lord. Thank you for that truth, Lord. Everything is under 
your feet. We are no longer under the dominion of death, Lord, for you have risen. We thank you, Lord. It just takes one word, Lord, and things change. Because all authority on heaven and on earth is yours, God. The gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Lord, we declare that we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We worship you tonight. Pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Y'all may be seated. I used to think that all the words were true. And now, as I got older and started to look at it more critically, I feel like a lot of it is allegories, things that are not exactly true. And a lot of things have been translated to, like, add or subtract something. I think it's useful as a piece of history and is something that can be interpreted. It's something that can deliver lessons. I think to interpret it literally is misguided and not helpful. The Bible, I just think that the Bible can be a little misleading and it's yeah. a little mean sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> I think of the Bible as a work of historical fiction. I'm going to say it definitely does have flaws, but it's more about the time it was written in. In the 21st century, we have definitely different ideals. And I think it's yeah. worrying that some people kind of pick and choose what they want from the Bible. So kind of maybe updating it okay. to, to the 21st century. Hold up. You want, you want to help her with that question? You weren't, you weren't with her answer, were you? No, I just wouldn't. It's incredible what people feel and think and, and assume about the Word of God. We call it the Bible. The world knows it as the Bible. It is the most widely published book of all time. It's probably the most widely read book of all time. It's not always the most widely followed book of all time. So we're gonna get into that tonight, but I just gotta tell you something that's, that's just, wow, it's overwhelming. I can't tell you how encouraged I am to be in this room, except that I'm even more encouraged to be in this room with you. What you offer to God in these moments as we gather together is precious. It's precious in the sight of God. I know that we're right about week five in this semester and, and even the middle of the week here in this week and I know that in this place that some of you in here feel like you've lived a whole week in just three days, right? Yeah. I know some of you have probably done some things and you wish you'd have done it better. I know some of you didn't do some things and you just wish you'd have done them, <laughs> right? I've been there. I've been there this week. What I'm here to tell you this is we know something. We can know something. We can know that in our weakness, his strength is perfected. It's not something I just made up. It's not just really a good you know, conference line. It's the word of God to you right here tonight. So if that's you here tonight, two things. One, know that when you feel the weakest, when you failed and you're, you're taking it on your shoulders, you're letting it shape who you are and how you think about you, know that that's not how he thinks about you. That he's given you one word. And you just need to reach out and walk in that word. It's the word of truth. And I promise you things change. They don't always become what we want them, but they change according to his plan and according to his word. He never deviates from that. But I'll tell you this, second, when the praise goes up, like happens in this place, the chains come off. The power of God and his presence falls. That's his word as well. If I'm encouraged to be in this place any given night, I'm even more encouraged to be here with you, and I'm even more encouraged just to stop and listen to the voices of the saints being lifted to the throne room of heaven where there's a loving father who is a good father and there's a king who's sitting on his right hand petitioning and saying, Father, that one, we need to help them. That one, send someone to encourage them. That one, help them see a provision today because those are the words that we need to cling to, not the words on the screen as we scroll through or that pop up in a word bubble. The words from our king 
who is a king, who is a warrior, but he also has been triumphant and he's secured the victory in you and for you and he loves you. I hope you feel that today. There's plenty of things around us that tell us different. We tell, we tell it to ourselves. We let other people speak into word, speak words into our lives that aren't true. But God, God speaks words that are true and they're for you. Don't miss that tonight. Don't miss the fact that who you are is who you are according to his word and his word alone. Tonight, we're gonna to talk about theology of scripture. Yeah, that's good. And give God's word a hand because none of us can take any credit for that one, right? That's right. Now, I hope you brought something to take notes, whether it's digital or whether it's a pen and paper, because God's word is, is rich with truth, and I'm going to cover all of it tonight, right? I'm just kidding, but I'm going to cover a lot tonight that helps us really grasp and understand what, it, what we really mean when we study God's word, when we understand the Bible, that simply put, these two words are what scream out of the storyline, and it is this, God speaks and God has spoken. God speaks. He speaks to us. He speaks to us in, 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 his, in his word. He speaks to us in all of creation, which by the way, all of creation came from, anybody know? His word. God speaks. His word is rich with truth, with justice, with correction, with rebuke, with instruction, and it's for one reason only. It's so that you, believer, can walk in righteousness and have everything you need. And so tonight, that's what we're going to do. And I'm going to ask you to find your, take your Bibles, however, verse, whatever method you have, and find 2 Timothy 3 tonight, because we'll start there. There's so much to say, and only a brief moment to say it, but we're going to trust that the Holy Spirit knows more than me. And I'm very confident that he does. And the places that I don't fill in, He's already gone before me. You know why I know that? Because he says it in his word. God speaks. Join me in 2 Timothy chapter three and verse 10. We're gonna be reading all the way through verse 17. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to meet to me at Antioch and Iconium and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured. Yet from them all, the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, this is where you need to put yourself face first into the scriptures. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing if you can highlight it in your, on your screen, if you can underline it in your Bible, knowing that word is important, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation, not by themselves, through faith in Christ Jesus. Because all scripture is breathed out of God and by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Mind you, Paul is talking to Timothy, who is a man of God. Women of God in the room, this, this intention of God's plan for his word is for you. It's for all of us. This letter is written to the church. It's written to Timothy, who is pastoring a church. And if this pastor is expected that God's word is profitable for all these things so that he would be equipped for every good work, then those whom he shepherds should also be equipped for every good work. See, I don't have to really twist that to apply it to everyone in the room. Because this is the truth right here. This right here, this is a special book. I've already said it, the Bible is the number one printed book in history and the most read book in history. It contains the most powerful message that the world has ever been given. This is more than a collection of sacred writings. This is how God speaks to us. This is how he talks to us. This is how he teaches us. This is how he answers us when we pray. 
This is how God speaks. It is both very personal and it's amazingly powerful. The deal is this. No one is born with a clear understanding of who God is. Mind you, no one is born with a clear understanding of who God is. Throughout the centuries, philosophers and religious types have declared their speculations, their thoughts, their assertions about God to no end with countless contradictions. But God chose to lift the fog of the guessing game about who he is with what we call and what we know to be divine revelation. It's important as we think about a theology of scripture that we enter into this conversation. It is good for us to discuss these, con these concepts here. You see, revelation is this. Revelation is how God speaks to humanity that is otherwise completely impossible. You can see that word revelation. There's maybe a, 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 a phonetic listening can, can maybe bring to mind the word reveal. This is how God reveals himself to you and to me, through revelation. And when he does that, the object or tool of that revelation is God's word, the Bible. You see, God communicates us through two types of revelation. First off, he communicates to us through what we call general revelation. That general revelation is how he makes himself known to us through his creation, through providence, and through our conscience so that we might come into a relationship with him. Listen to what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 19. By the way, there's gonna be a lot of scripture on the screen tonight. So if you got a camera and you can't write fast enough, then you may wanna use it. Psalm 19 says this in the first four verses. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. And in them he has set a tent for the sun. This is God's general revelation the psalmist is declaring. And in the New Testament, Paul did something very similar in Romans chapter one, verses 19 through 20. And he made this statement, for what can be known about God is plain to them. In other words, those who don't know, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since when? The creation of the world. God began this story of revealing himself from the moment the first creative action from his mouth began. And in all the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. That's general revelation. That's the, 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 the broad spectrum of how God reveals himself to mankind, to men and women created in his image. By the way, if you're not a believer, it doesn't mean you're not created in his image. It means you haven't been redeemed. It means you haven't stepped in to that relationship to know him enough to then begin to know him deeply in his word. But all of us are created in his image and all of us have been given a testimony of God's general revelation. So we are without excuse. You say, that's harsh. Actually, it's incredibly kind, compassionate, and so intentional and very personal. But there, I said there are two ways that God reveals and communicates with us and the other is special revelation. And special revelation, this is the act by which God makes himself known, listen to this, through his redemptive word and the work of Jesus Christ so that we might come into a relationship with him. Now, for those of you that are very critical and analytical, you may have seen that statement up there on that screen and you might've said, well, wait a minute, did Dr. Temple switch some words around? Shouldn't it be his redemptive work and the word of Jesus Christ? Absolutely not. His redemptive word, the word of God is redemptive because it comes from him. And we experienced that here on this planet, mankind, when Jesus walked the earth and became flesh in the redemptive work that he did while he was here. In fact, in both cases, it was God's word declaring the redemption right here in this book, and it was God's work in the word made flesh still declaring the work of redemption in Jesus Christ. That's the special revelation. Listen, beloved, listen, if you can't get really intimate with the gospel message by understanding what special revelation is, then you need to listen deeply to what God is calling us to. 
Hebrews chapter one and verses one and two say this. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. Wow, I love this part. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. That's you and me and everything on it. Through his son. So the Bible, this book, this book is not to be worshiped. This book contains the special revelation that is from God, his communication to you. This book is special, and God speaks through every word recorded in these pages. And listen to this. And when God speaks, there is life. There is life. When God speaks, life is upon us. When his words, his word brings life. To those who would rebel and those who would run, they they get a different response. But to those who would respond and those who would run to, they get life. His word brings life. In his words, we have our being. Don't mention, don't miss this. In his words, we have our being. As I shared with you as we began, the world has truths to press into us about who we are, but it's in his words that we find our being. Listen to Genesis chapter one and two. God spoke and life existed. Then God breathed and Adam had life. Day one, God speaks, let there be light. Day two, God speaks, let there be an expanse or a firmament. Day three, God speaks, let there be oceans and dry land. God speaks, let there be vegetation. Day four, God speaks, let there be stars for the night and the day. Day five, God speaks, let there be fish and birds. Day six, God speaks, let there be land animals. God speaks, let us make man. Then God breathes the breath of life into Adam. When God speaks, there is life. If we have our being, according to the Genesis account, if we have our being, as Adam had his being, in the very words of God, then here's here's what you need to understand. Then we have our being in Jesus Christ alone. How do I get there? John 1, 1 through 4 say this. In the beginning was the, anybody know? It's the word. But he tells us who that is. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. Listen to verse four. In him was life and life and the life was the light of men. When God speaks, there is life. The word made flesh also brings life. And down in verse 14, wow, listen to this. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of only the Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Beloved, this book is special. If we are to be Jesus' people, then we must be people of the book. There's no way to be Jesus' people because it's the word made flesh and God's word is is given to us in special revelation here. You can't be a Jesus' people without being people of the book. So tonight, my prayer is that what you will leave here knowing three important truths and become acquainted with some evidence that supports them. Number one would be that the Bible is true and can be trusted. Number two is that the Bible is reliable and timeless. Number three, that the Bible, (laughs) I love this, the Bible is enough and has everything that we need. This book contains the most powerful message that the world has ever been given. However, the Bible is more than a collection of sacred writings. Number one, the Bible is true and it can be trusted. Where did this book come from? The Bible, so you know, was written over the course of 1,500 years by over about 60 generations. The Bible was written on three continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe, and many different types of places such as prisons, palaces, in the wilderness, and on the road. The New Testament speaks of the Old Testament as scripture from which the Greek word graphe is used, which means writings. The word Bible comes from the Greek word for book. In other words, the Holy Bible actually means the Holy Book. But the Bible actually contains 66 separate books, 39 books in the Old Testament, which is a record of time from God creating the world and our first parents, Adam and Eve. 
until the coming of Jesus Christ into human history. And then the 27 books of the New Testament begin with the four gospels, which record the life, death, burial, and resurrection, and the return to heaven of Jesus, and then proceed with instructions to various Christians and Christian churches about how to think and live in light of who Jesus is and what he has done. In this way, the Bible is really more of a library of books rather than a single book. Maybe who wrote this book? Anybody know? This is an easy one. God wrote this book. You say, wait a minute, is it more complicated? No, no. Sometimes how God works is complicated in the sense we can't think the way he does. God wrote this book and he used more than 40 people to record it. These people were, among other things, kings and fishermen and scholars and peasants. God the Holy Spirit directed some authors to write his message immediately and allowed others to pass on his message orally through generations until it was recorded. It was written in three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And it is critical to understand that the people who wrote down these words were instruments in God's hand. This is special, and it comes from God alone. This belief is called verbal plenary inspiration. To help you understand that definition, it means that the very words, plenary, verbal, every part of the Bible, plenary, inspiration are divinely inspired revelation. Every, the very words of the Bible, every part of the Bible, are divinely inspired and revealed to us about who God is. Simply put, God the Holy Spirit inspired not just the thoughts, but the details and the very words that were recorded in all of Scripture. Second Peter chapter one, listen to this in verse 20. Knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. That's a caution, right? Be careful. Be careful to think and ask, what do you think this means? Because you can know what it means. You don't have to guess at what it means. You have to study deeply to learn what it means. But when I'm in a group, I'm, I really don't care what you think. I wanna hear what we know. Now, as we wrestle with things, we begin to wrestle with things and we wonder, is this what the text is saying? But beloved, I promise you, as we search deeply, as the Bereans did in the book of Acts, they kept searching the word daily to see if these things were so. That's what we're called to do if we are Jesus' people. We have to be people of the book. Does it come from someone's own interpretation? 21 says, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Praise God. This is the inspired word of God. And as such, it is without error and it is absolute in authority. This is the final word. It's the final word on all of it. This is why we can spend our time being molded and being shaped and letting the character of Jesus Christ develop in us richly so that as we share, as we help to correct and account, be in accountability with each other, we can do it from a loving, compassionate perspective because we are not the ones speaking, we are the ones agreeing with God. This is what unifies us. I don't have to worry about your opinion or your opinion. You don't have to worry about my opinion. We unify around the word of God. Beloved, the Bible is true and can be explicitly trusted. The Chicago Statement on Biblical errancy, Inerrancy, oh, that's a bad one. The Dean of the Divinity about messed up. From 1978 says this, it is of infallible divine authority in all matters upon which it touches. Listen, it is to be believed as God's instruction in all that it affirms obeyed as God's command in all that it requires embraced as God's pledge in all that it promises. What's more, God has inspired the Holy Scripture in order to thereby reveal himself to lost mankind through Jesus Christ as creator and Lord, redeemer and judge. Holy Scripture is God's witness to himself. 
I gotta, you, 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 I hope you catch this. This is so important for your life. Because truth is what we stand on. It's not what we make it. After the cross and the empty tomb, the Bible is how God gave himself. He offered himself in a special revealing moment. He offered himself to mankind and revealed himself to reconcile that which was lost in the Garden of Eden, dot, 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 a personal relationship with him. After the cross and the resurrection, this was the redemptive act of a loving God to make sure that he revealed himself to everyone who would pick this book up so they could know him, so they could begin a lifeline connection with him and then grow deeply in the words that are covered in all of these pages. This book is special. Beloved, this book is special and this book is very personal. Prior to the Genesis fall, there was no need for special revelation of God's word as Adam and Eve enjoyed a literal, personal relationship with God. In Genesis 3, 8 through 9, we read this. After they sinned, God came walking as was his custom, looking for Adam and Eve. And of course, God played along to the degree that probably broke his heart. Where are you? Like God didn't know. Parents do that all the time. When they know their kids have done something, to give them an opportunity to come to them in this relationship so we can begin the restorative process. I don't know what life would have looked like on this planet, but I know that when God comes to you and you know you are, you are feeling and you're in a position of conviction because of sin, in disobedience to him, run to him, not from him. He is a God that loves us. He wants to know you. And he's made every effort to make sure you can know him. But when sin entered the picture, a barrier was placed between humanity and God. Adam and Eve hid from, the, from God and feared him rather than seek him out and anticipate spending time with him. That's what makes the Bible this special revelation. That's what makes the Bible necessary. That's right. The Bible is necessary. It is necessary in order for mankind to have a relationship with God. To be clear, this is what I'm not saying, salvation comes through confession and belief. But for believers to know God more deeply, they must know him in a way that is only possible through God's very words that have been given to us in the Bible. Number two, the Bible is reliable and timeless. You heard on that video, there was a perspective and a worldview at work when they were asked questions about God's word. And we hear that all the time. This thing is, this thing is antiquated and out of date. You should just toss it aside. Hey, all the stuff about Jesus loving people, yeah, that's really good. I wish more people in churches would love people because that's the good part. But you don't get just a, a, a sliver of God. You get all of him. He's placed himself completely and fully in a relationship with you. And it's not on my terms. I bear his images. He doesn't bear mine. This is who we are be, have been given in his word. Christianity, this is why this book is so incredible. I, I, Christianity is a reliable based faith. Not a might be based faith, not a, not a what if based faith or a someday based faith or I wish based faith or I guess based faith. It's a reliable based faith. First John 5, 13 tells us it's a reliable based faith. When it says this, John wrote to the church, he said, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may what? That you may what? Say it again, that you may what? No. That you may know. Beloved, you don't have to question. You don't have to wonder. He's given us his word revealed of him so that you may know. You all live in relationships sometimes and you don't know where that relationship stands. We all do. By the way, that doesn't stop when you get married. The reality is, is that the, the life we live in relationship, even in covenant marriage, because of our own brokenness, we have times where we wonder where is the relationship. It doesn't mean we're talking about breaking that relationship. It means we're struggling through things. You, you with God, you can know these things. 
You don't have to wonder about the past. You don't have to wonder, like when I was four years old when I came to know Jesus Christ. And you know what was done for me? You know what God's gift was to me? You know what he did to, to secure me? He gave me himself and his word. To be trained up in the fear and the admonition of God, the word of God. Beloved, it doesn't mean you won't have moments of questioning or doubt, but it means you can know. Look, when I was four years old, I couldn't explain the hypostatic union. And if you don't know what that is, then that's a, it's not a big deal. You can still be his. I don't have to know all the technical theological jargon to be his. I have to confess and I have to believe. And when I did that at four years old, he made me his. And then we began a process and a relationship so I could know from his word. And I could walk in that. And I could, go str I could grow strong in my relationship, in my, in, my, in my faith. What do we know for sure about the Bible? I love this. How reliable is the Bible? But just to give you just a, a little snippet. When we get to historical books that are really, really old, especially ones that have to be dug up and then translated, they don't really translate them till they have a certain number of manuscripts that have either pieces or just a part or some or whole, and they get enough of it together and they compare these texts and these manuscripts and then they start to piece together what this old piece of literature says and they make sure that everything they found adds up and, it, and, it's, and, it's, and it's agreement, it's in agreement. So the first century historian, Josephus, which people rely on as an authoritative text in the history of the world, there were nine manuscripts they found and they had a high enough confidence rate that they said, yeah, this is what he said. By the way, that confidence rate wasn't very high, but it was high enough. Plato's writings had 30 manuscripts. There were quite a few variances. Homer, I don't know if you ever read that in high school, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> Take me back and let me read it again. No, I'd rather binge watch like the High Tower or the Golden Rings or something. Just give me something else. Or even some crying show that stirs up your emotions or something like This Is Us or I, whatever. I, I don't want to read that again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I like to forget about it. Homer's Iliad has 650 manuscripts. But the New Testament, over 24,000. The accuracy of those 24,000 when compared to each other has an accuracy rate of 99.5%. That means there's no contradiction. There may be a definite article here or, or a scribble here, depending on, they find them in the dirt and caves, okay? So there's sometimes you see, you see smudges on these things. But the text itself supports the, all the manuscripts. They don't contradict each other. That's the reliability we have. You know why? Not because historians are really good at digging up stuff and translating, because God gave us his word and he's preserved his word for you and for me through all out history and, and will to, until he returns. Because when he returns, guess what? The word made flesh will be now with us and we can set this one over here and, and bask in the glory of the word made flesh when the king of kings returns. You see, the theology of scripture is not just this book. The theology of scripture is unequivocally Jesus Christ himself. And we can know that the, what the Bible says and what it says is true and it's reliable and it's timeless. Number three, the Bible is enough and it has everything we need. I wish I could have just started with number three because I think this is where we all struggle most of our lives. Asking these questions, are the words that I read in here really for me? When I go and I read through 1 Samuel chapter 2 and I read that passage, is that really for me? Yes, it's for me. We just sang that tonight. 1 Samuel 2, Hannah's prayer. We just sang the words of God tonight. It is for you. It is timeless. It has everything you need. This book changes lives. Not because the book is mystically powerful, because it is the word of God and it is the word made. Jesus Christ 
changes lives. Hebrews 4 and verse 12 says, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart, which Jeremiah 17, 9 says is desperately wicked. Who can actually know it? The word of God can know it. Is that, who can know it? I tell you that right now. And we need to test our hearts, motives, and intentions by aligning with something that doesn't change because our hearts are so fickle. When a cell phone can make you moody, you need to put it down and open up the book. I'm just saying. Why is that? Because 2 Timothy 3.17, we've already read it tonight, says that the man of God, so that God's people may be complete, so you won't be lacking and you'll be equipped for every good work. You know why? Because from the foundation of the earth, he's already, he's already predestined. I know some people get scared of that word, but guess what? You know what? It's in the book. He has predestined the good works for us to live out in obedience to his word. As Christians, we should hold scripture to be the highest authority by which other lesser authorities are tested. Practically, this means that reason, tradition, and culture are all under the highest authority of truth, which is divinely inspired scripture. This is where the Protestant Reformation stamped the term solo scriptura or scripture alone to summarize this conviction. The Bible is simply amazing. In it, we have been given everything for life and godliness. Second Peter 1 and verse 3, his divine power has granted us to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him, the only way you know him is through these, these words, who called us to his own glory and excellence. That's all pretty overwhelming, I'll be honest with you. If you let that sit in for a minute, it's completely overwhelming. When I first came to Liberty University, I was a freshman. I was in the greatest decade that's ever existed because we had parachute pants. <laughs> Mind you, I did not say I had parachute pants. I was too cool for parachute pants, but I'm not too cool for a members only jacket. I wish I had one that fit. But I got a letter jacket with some pins on it, but it still doesn't fit. When I came to Liberty as a freshman in 1987, I was so hungry for God. She doesn't necessarily, you don't have to have her call me out. She was giving a testimony and was so encouraging. When I came here in 1987, I used to love getting alone. I lived in what then was dorm one. For those of you that were in Evan, Dr. Wheeler's Evan class, I tried to point it out on the screen last week and then for the class this week. But I lived in dorm one, which is kind of where Commons One bus stop is right now. And I used to love getting alone and we had a prayer room in our dorms in every single dorm. And I would get in there late at night and just read the Bible. I, here's what I would do. I would read it, then I would pray, and I would ask God what he wanted me to do with it. I didn't just try to figure out, I didn't want to have to, you know, figure out and have this great understanding where I could unpack it and tell everybody else what it means. I wanted him to tell me what I was to do with it because God's word changes your life. It's pretty simple, right? Have you ever done that? Have you ever just read a passage of scripture? It happens to me all the time. And you read a passage of scripture and then you think, wow, whew, never seen it that way. I'm, that verse has never popped out that way. But it didn't take long until I was taught how to look at the detailed structure of the Bible and do what we call exegesis, which means to pull out the theological, the doctrinal truths that are so practical for your life to live it out. Somehow I had lost the simple purity though of reading, praying, being led, and obeying. That's who we're called to be, people of the book. We read, we pray, let God lead us, and then do it, obey it. Author Jerry Bridges said this, reading gives us breadth, but study gives us depth. You get your root down when you study God's word. My friend Don Whitney said it this way, no spiritual discipline is more important than the intake of God's word. Nothing can substitute for it. Beloved, tonight and every day, God has a message for you from his word. What message does he have for you tonight? He has always had a message, and he has a message that is very specific every time we read God's word. Biblical authors wrote about many controversial subjects and yet maintained one consistent theme. God loves and forgives us for our sins. 
The Bible is God's tool to help you and me meet him. And once we have met him, help, it helps us to know him. Not know about him. Don't start with knowing about. This book is to help us know him. This is deeply personal. John 5 and verse 39, Jesus himself is indicting some religious leaders and he says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. Don't be deceived, beloved, that the more you read the Bible that you will have eternal life. This book does not give you eternal life. The words and the chapters don't give you a third eternal life. And, and Jesus said this, and it is they that bear witness about me, Jesus said. You don't search the scriptures thinking you have eternal life. You search the scriptures and let Jesus come off the page because this is about him. He said to these leaders, yet you refuse to come to me. Why? And so that you may have life. Because remember, when God speaks, when God's word is there, there is life. Jesus is talking to these leaders who are supposed to know and be experts on the scriptures that they claim to know so well. Sometimes we get good at knowing things about God, but we refuse to truly know him. You know why? Because that would be too risky. Because to truly know God means we have to follow through on what we learn. Listen to Jeremiah. I love the Old Testament. It's so good. I gotta tell you, if you don't think it's good, then, then somebody hasn't teaching it to you right. It's so good. It's so rich. It's a story. It's, a, it's the oldest story there is. Jeremiah chapter nine and verse 23, thus says the Lord. That's a great place to start, by the way. <laughs> thus says the Lord. Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, righteousness in the earth. For in these Things I delight, declares the Lord. It is so important for you to understand that God wants you to know him and he can be known by you. When you read these words, I know, and when you're reading the Bible, so often you'll also find the words that you may know. So when you pause, listen, and, and, and when you've lived a week, like maybe some of you this week, and you've gotten halfway through a week that feels like a full week or two weeks, when you hit pause because life has you scared stiff or you're stifled by a question that stands in front of you, don't pause and wish to find the answers that might be right. Pause and know that God's word gives you confidence and true hope. Know that these are more than words. These are a lifeline connecting you to God himself. He will not only give you the answers from the Bible, but he will give you himself. He gives you himself. We know that he gave himself for the church, but beloved, in this room, if you're in a commons, if you're over on the East Campus, if you're over at the Annex, if you're living in Lynchburg, or wherever you live, he gave you himself. And we find it here in his word. You can know this. He doesn't want you guessing. He says you can know this. The Bible gives us a connection to him. Psalm 1, 1 through 3 is one of the first passages of scripture I ever memorized in my young life. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffers. Listen to this. That man's blessed, why? Because of verse two. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on it he meditates day and night. Because of that, verse three, he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither and all that he does prospers. Man, maybe you just need to get really intimate with Psalm 1, 1 through 3. You need to get your roots deep by the streams of living water. Jesus Christ is the living water. The Bible gives us a connection to him. The Bible also gives is God's plan to help us know his way. Psalm 119. What a great chapter in Psalm. Whew. Verses nine through 11. Listen to this. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it with your word. According to your word. With my whole heart, I will seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart. Why? So that I might not sin against you. See, that's what happened in the garden. They sinned against him. They had the opportunity to walk with the word. They chose their own words. 
separated them. Seeking God in the Bible, in Bible study is one of the ways we grow closer to God. God's ways can't be separated from his character and seeking God by studying his word is the key to knowing him and learning how to live according to his ways and his character. The Bible gives us everything we need to live for him. You've probably heard this verse. Jesus quoted it in Matthew chapter four. In Deuteronomy eight and verse three, uh, Moses is indicting the people and charging to them and saying this, and he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, in order that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. You know why? so that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. And this knowledge of God will lead to life change. This is where it takes us tonight. Matthew chapter seven and verse 24 through 27 says this, Jesus said, therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a sensible man who builds his house on a rock. That rock's not gonna move. The pastor of Jerusalem church James himself, the half-brother of Jesus, said this in chapter one, don't be, doer, be doers of the word, not just hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Beloved, when you know about him and you think you know him and you don't live for him and obey him, you are deceiving everyone around you or trying, but you're only deceiving yourself. So when you walk out and you think the power of God is not on your life, it's because he's waiting for you to bring your deception and cast it before him in confession and truly live a life that's obedient. Some of you in here, you've heard the gospel a thousand times. Some of you responded to the gospel at a young age. Some of you responded to the gospel this semester. Some of you responded a couple years ago and some of you maybe still haven't responded. Here's what you've gotta know, that when we respond to the gospel, we can know that we are in him and then our, our, our responsibility and, our, and this relationship is to know him and live out his word. The Bible gives us this knowledge and it, and it gives us life and redemption through Jesus Christ. John 1, 1 through 4, we've already read because he is the word of God. But verse 4 says, in him was life and the life was the light of men. But don't miss this. In John 1, 10 through 13, it says, he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. It's always troubled me to read that verse. He came to his own and his own people didn't receive him. But to, who, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The Bible is enough, it has everything you need. I can close this book but God speaks. So what has he spoken to you tonight? God speaks. And God has spoken in this place tonight. God's word is spoken specifically using words that say one thing from the beginning to the end, from Genesis chapter one to Revelation 22, and it is this, that God loves you Christian, you need to hear that. We need to share that with each other every single day. Encourage each other with these words because the days are getting harder. Remind one another that God loves you. And because my God loves you and you can know that, I love you too. But he also forgives you. This book has a central character. That central character is Jesus Christ himself. The whole book is about him and it's deeply personal. The Old Testament predicts his coming and sets the stage for his entrance into the world. The New Testament describes his coming and his work to bring salvation to every single person who would come to him. My question is this, do you have that connection? There's always two kinds of people in a room. There are people who have the personal relationship connection with Jesus Christ, with the word that was made flesh himself, and people that don't. And if you don't, maybe tonight you should. Maybe you should not let another day go by 
And by the way, this is, this is so much more than what happens in some liturgical or expectation way in here. Here's what happens. You go find somebody tonight in a community group. You go find a resident shepherd. You go find an RA. You go find a friend. You say, I want to have that connection. And as I speak to the, the majority of this room, and I would say, brother and sister in Christ, because we are brothers and sisters together. Are you living out in obedience the word of God in your life? Are you more enamored with the ability to read it and say it says things and tell other people about it or maybe critique something that you see happening? Because we're really good at that, right? I don't know if it gets all over you, but sometimes I just have to take a break from watching stuff. Because all anybody ever wants to do is talk about how that's not right and that's not right and that's not right and that's not right, but am I right? I'm only right if I'm, if I'm doing what Jesus said, if you hear his words and then you do them. Believer, here's what you need to do tonight. Maybe some of you tonight need to have a fresh commitment to the word. You say, I am a Jesus person, but I, tonight, I'm gonna be a person of the book. I'm gonna be committed to letting Jesus speak to me. I'm gonna be committed to reading it. I'm gonna be committed to praying and asking God what he wants me to do with it. We talk about what can happen around this planet if a room like this really was sold out for God. You know what sold out means? It means you got a weird faith, even an odd faith, because you read this book and you believe that this book is alive and it is personal and that it's true and that it's reliable and that it has everything you need and that you're gonna live by it. See, people who don't have that connection will tell us this is odd, this is weird, but we are called to not be odd or weird. We're called to be Jesus' people and be people of his word and of this book. This book is special. It changes lives. Ezekiel 36 says this. Jesus told the people in his, through the prophet Ezekiel that he would give them a new heart and he would put a new spirit in them. God speaks. Make sure we're listening. Bond together and obey. Father, in this moment, we ask you to have your will and your way the way you have defined. God, may whatever needs to happen in anyone's life in this room, may it be driven by their desire to know you through your word that's written and through you who are the, is the word made flesh. God, call us to repentance. Bring us to a refreshing new commitment to be people of the book. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Hey, can I tell you something? And I'm not kidding. There are a few, there are a few things more beautiful than hearing you guys sing. Like there is something really special about being this room where everyone in here is singing at that level. And, and, and these guys can just sort of back off and all of us are just leading one another in worship. That's a really special thing. And it's a really special thing also for the kind of person who walks in on a night like tonight, maybe. Maybe you're in the room and you're like, man, I, I honestly didn't even feel like I had it in me to sing, but that, like everyone else was singing sort of for me. And you hear that and gosh, that's such an encouragement. It's a huge encouragement to me. And thank you guys for that. Hey, two quick things uh, before we dismiss from here. One, I'm not gonna keep saying this because hopefully you're getting the rhythm of it, uh, but we're gonna talk with uh, Pastor Troy tomorrow on the podcast. If you have questions for tonight, questions, 839-858. Hopefully you're getting the hang of it and we can start making this announcement each week. It's a lot of fun. We've been having a great time on the podcast. Um, so text your questions to 839-858 or text the word questions to 839-858 and you'll get the form for it. All right, here's the other thing real quick. Next week for Campus Community, I wanna explain how this is gonna work. It's gonna be a lot of fun because we're gonna have uh, David Platt opening God's word for us. And we're gonna have Shane and Shane leading worship for us. But this is how it's gonna work. So campus community, seven o'clock, normal time. Shane and Shane will have worship. Uh, David's gonna open up God's word for us. But as way of response, right? So right around eight o'clock or so, after David finishes, as way of response, the Shanes are coming in and they're going to have an extended time of worship next week where they're gonna do a live recording here in Vine Center of their album, Psalms, Hymns, and Spiritual Songs. So it'll be a full show next Wednesday night. Campus Community, seven o'clock, extended time of worship with the Shanes. It's gonna be a blast. They're gonna have the film crew. They're bringing their whole team up here to do it for their Psalms, Hymns, and Spiritual Songs. That's how next week's gonna go. We'll talk about it more before then, but I wanted to give you guys a heads up that that's what's coming next week. It should be a lot of fun, and I'm hoping we can pack the house out for the Shanes. That's next week. Have a great night. You guys are dismissed. <laughs>